Yes, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Omkar Hiramat, a student of uh, third semester MBA. Uh, I'm very delighted to welcome Dr. Roland Haas, uh, who gladly agreed to carry out this session with us. Uh, and uh, as we came to know that uh, he's a, a celebrity speaker, so we are very glad to have him have him on this uh, webinar. I would also like to welcome our Dean Professor Captain Nagra Subbarao sir, along with uh, all the professors of uh, MBA and Executive MBA, and all the participants uh, who are present in this virtual session, who are for sure going to have a wonderful and informative session. I would like uh, uh, to introduce our distinguished speaker to the audience. Dr. Roland Haas is a professor at the International Institute of uh, Information Technology, Bengaluru, India and chairman of QSO Technologies India Private Limited, a consulting and system engineering service provider, which he founded in 2007. He has 25 years of professional experience in research, a senior techno managerial business innovation and business assignments in Germany, India, uh, Japan, Israel, etc. Dr. Haas has broad experience in automotive R&D, aerospace R&D, system engineering, software and IT services, consulting and strategy. From, two th uh, from 1993 to 2006, uh, he worked with the Daimler Group, heading the Daimler India R&D Center in Bengaluru from 2001 to 2006. Dr. Haas has co-authored several books, the most recent one being a textbook on automotive connectivity and cybersecurity published by Springer. Dr. Haas was an adjunct faculty member of Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru, and has done teaching and research in cybersecurity, automotive electronics, car IT, uh, software technologies, auto autonomous systems, management information systems, virtual product creation. He is an alumnus of the German National Academic Foundation and Mercedes-Benz Scholarship Foundation. Dr. Haas studied computer science, mathematics, and electrical engineering at the University of Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe and the Technical University of Klaus Thal. Sir, welcome. Uh, before you uh, start the session, I would like to uh, ask uh, Raksha to let the ground rules uh, know. And uh, over to you, Raksha. Thank you. Thank you, Omkar. Hello, everyone. I am Raksha, I am student of third semester MBA from Dayanand Sagar University. Welcome you all to this wonderful session. And I would like to thank DSS committee for giving me this opportunity. In this session, sir will be giving his presentation for 45 to 50 minutes. And I know many will be keen on asking questions. So please drop your questions in the Q&A box. After the presentation, I'll be taking those questions. And I'd be possibly taking few questions because of the time constraint. So please excuse me for that. At the end of the session, I'll be sending the feedback link in the chat box. So please fill that form. I can assure you this session will be very interesting and enlightening. Hope you all enjoy this session. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome for this seminar on cybersecurity. I will share the screen and hope everything is visible now. In presentation mode, is it visible, the slides? Yes. Good, fantastic. So we will talk about cybersecurity today. It's of course a vast topic and for today's uh, session, I have uh, given you here some topics I would like to address. We will talk about the cybersecurity of critical infrastructures. Then we look at some trends and challenges. Then we pick one of the critical infrastructures, healthcare, and look at some cybersecurity challenges here. I will also talk about digital transformation as it is one of the fundamental drivers of dark side of that, the cybersecurity issues that come up. And here I picked the example of the automotive industry. 
Then we will talk a little more about the automotive cybersecurity domain. We will have a glimpse on machine learning and artificial intelligence in cybersecurity, a very interesting and upcoming area. Uh, cybersecurity management systems I will address briefly because that's at the core of many of the initiatives. And then finally, we'll give you some ideas of the research domains and interests of my cybersecurity group and some of the other groups at Triple ITB. We do have a few professors who are working on this topic and uh, there are lots of interesting uh, research projects going on. Finally, the discussions, and we will definitely have question. We have uh, some time for questions. So please stop me if I shoot over the timeline too much because this topic is just so interesting. One can easily get lost in that. I would start with the cybersecurity word cloud. So there are so many terms that are important in the cybersecurity domain, but at the heart of that is that you have cybersecurity goals, you want your information to be confidential, it should be available, uh, there should be the integrity of this, and you want to authenticate systems and people. On the other side, you have the adversaries who are trying to intrude into systems, who are trying to exploit vulnerabilities, and there's always a kind of arms race between these sides, the ones who want to protect the systems, and the ones who actually want to intrude in the systems and destroy structure. And that can be especially critical if you talk about systems that run the backbone of the nations, of the countries, the critical infrastructures. There are several critical infrastructures and we'll touch upon a few of them today, but of course there are many more, energy, space, transport sector, communication sector, water, healthcare sector, and so forth. And there have been a lot of cyber attacks on these sectors. So I will show you a few now. For example, there was a ransomware attack on the Irish health service and hospitals just this year in 2021, with devastating effect, shutting down hospitals. They could not admit patients anymore. Then there was a ransomware attack on the uh, food industry, JBS, the world's largest meat processing company, was attacked, had to shut down plants in the United States. This attack only came shortly after, you know, another devastating attack, which we will talk a few minutes later. But when you look at that, the attacks on the energy grid and the Ukraine got very infamous when that happened in 2015. Uh, where actually the power grid of uh, Ukraine was shut down. The circuit uh, cutters were actually remotely controlled and uh, this uh, attack led actually to the shutdown of the power grid with hundreds of thousands of people being out of power. Then the ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline, the same year that also this GBS attack happened, that actually shut off the pipeline, the supply from oil and gas from the southern US to the eastern seaboard. And it has created a havoc in the United States because a lot of gas stations ran out of supply. Then attacks on railways, mobility service providers, and as a larger part of the automotive, the transport sector, the automotive business, automotive OEMs and suppliers being attacked. And that topic, we will look into that into more detail a little later. And then maybe the next new battleground, where could that be? Maybe cyber warfare in space. A lot of pictures are being taken, remote monitoring devices on the satellites that actually integrate with backend structures. And that might be a new battleground for the future. So the message is critical infrastructure as important as they are, but they are vulnerable to attacks. What are the trends in this critical infrastructure attacks that we can see? The attacks have become more complex and sophisticated. You see on the side gas station out of gas after the colonial pipeline attack. But those attacks on cybersecurity on uh, critical infrastructure really have become more sophisticated. They also have become more extensive, causing greater damage. The cyber criminals conduct an in-depth reconnaissance. They take a lot of time to plan their attacks. 
They do extensive spear phishing with deep fakes and AI support. This has become so sophisticated that it's extremely difficult now to differentiate, you know, a real email or a real person talking to you from a deep fake AI. Different hacker groups collaborate, combining their specific expertise. So it's not only the hacker sitting in this room and you know doing that on its own, but there are many, many groups together working together. And they have also done this work sharing now with specific interests and specific expertise that they bring together. And then its common theme is the conversions of information technology and operation technology. This operational technology is controlling this infrastructure. These are the PLCs or the scatter controllers that interact with additional systems, control loops that we are being controlled with supervisory control levels on top, and everything is connected. And this conversion creates new potential attack vectors. The connectivity itself is increasing, you know, remote control, logging into a system, industry 4.0 or industrial internet are keywords here where the data is being gathered from these systems for maintenance purposes or prediction purposes. But on the other side, it could be also exploited. And what you see also is a lot of sensitive sectors like the food, the agri-tech, transport system, oil and gas, and water supply are being targeted. For example, food and agriculture, agricultural systems were not so much in the focus of attackers if you look uh, 10 years back. But now they have become the focus and the havoc that can be created by attacking the food industry or agricultural industry is huge. And with GBS attack, you see that this is really happening as we speak. State-sponsored cybercrime is on the rise. They, of course, have the deep pockets to actually create weapons of cyber destruction and also plan and implement very meticulous cyber threats. The ransom fees are paid in cryptocurrencies typically. And when we look at what such an attack looks like, I want to give you an example here from Stuxnet. Stuxnet, you could call it the mother of all these infrastructure hacks, because definitely governments behind it, it was an attack on the Iran's nuclear enrichment capabilities. And the way it worked is typical for critical infrastructure attacks that are very well planned. In this case, several steps led to that. You have to take into account that, you know, a enrichment facility in Iran, of course, was pretty isolated from others. So it's not network because it's a sensitive infrastructure that was not accessible to the network. So the attackers had to find different ways to intrude the system. But what they did is they studied the systems and they found out that it is possible actually to hack into a Siemens controller that was running the centrifuge spinning devices and the centrifuge spinning devices for the enrichment of uranium have to be controlled very precisely to run with high speed RPMs, not too high speed and not too low, so that the enrichment process would work. But if they would run too fast, they would wear and tear off very rapidly. So what the system actually did, a very, very complex attack they were able to hijack those controllers of the spinning devices. Then they drove them up to spin higher than normal. So they would rapidly tear and wear and actually shut down. But the critical thing is here, because the people would easily, the monitoring uh, staff would easily see that and could then you know, interfere. They also hacked into the system that was monitoring that so that the values they saw were normal values. It was just an operating mode. Nothing looked suspicious. However, one by one, these centrifuges came down. And such an attack, of course, needs a lot of planning, which was done. They exploited so-called zero days from the operating system that was kind of integrated in this infrastructure. And Step by step, were they able to infiltrate the systems of the Natanz operation and then actually shut down without 
you know, the operating teams and monitoring teams actually to have a clue that they were attacked. In this case, because the system was not networked, they had to use a typical USB port or infiltrated the systems of people that were not very careful. And they actually did a lot of reconnaissance and intelligence to figure out whom they could target. So to intrude the system and get into the Natanz plant. So that's a kind of template for many of those things. But you know, any device that is networked, if it's a commercial electronic device, smart home device could be attacked. And the attack patterns would be similar. And if it makes sense, it will be attacked. So this is just a cartoon with a nice message. The toaster has been hacked into thinking it's a blender. Well, that renders it completely useless then. Let's look at another sector, the healthcare sector. And cyber attacks here actually all had devastating consequences. We already talked about the Irish Healthcare Service, HSE. They faced a massive ransomware attack. Ransomware is a tech vector where actually then finally the files will be encrypted so that they are unreadable. And then the attackers will ask the ransom fee. That's where the term ransom comes from. If you pay, you might be lucky that you get a decryption key and you can read your files again. But in many cases, you are unlucky. Even if you pay, you might not get it back. The consequences here of this ransomware attack on the hospital were that actually a lot of the outpatients had to be sent off. The hospital could not admit critical patients anymore and it for weeks was actually offline. So this was a really devastating ransomware attack. Another one, Scripps Health in San Diego, a combination of ransomware also theft of patient data, which is also very sensitive. You know, the patient set data with healthcare records being stolen has large repercussions and last, a large loss in the trust of the patients regarding how their data is being kept. We also saw massive ransomware attacks on hospitals and healthcare providers in New Zealand, all in the same year in 2021. And then in Germany, a ransomware attack on the University Hospital in Düsseldorf in Germany just last year actually most likely really led to the deaths of a patient. She actually could not be admitted to this hospital, which was close to her home, but she had to be running a detour. The ambulance ran a detour to another hospital because her hospital, a university hospital in Düsseldorf was not operational anymore. She had to shut uh, a lot of systems down because of a ransomware attack. In Fresenius, one of Europe's largest private hospital operators, a major provider also of dialysis products and services, also fell victim to a ransomware attack, all in a short, rather short time frame. And this list would go on and on and on. So I just picked some of the more prominent, more infamous ones, but actually you will see many hospitals have been attacked and many regions and countries have been attacked here. Now, when we look at the cyber attacks in healthcare, what are the common themes here? And on the right side, you'd see a picture of the European National Network Information Security Agency and their vision of a smart hospital where everything is connected with each other. That makes a lot of sense because you can share that information, you can track, extract information, you can run it very efficiently. However, the problem is when systems are networked, they do have an attack surface and cyber criminals could actually exploit that and use that. What we see is that the cyber attacks now on the healthcare sector are actually a global phenomenon. Some cyber groups, they don't attack hospitals because they say it's not ethical to do that if they just are for ransom, but many do. And unfortunately, this really has devastating consequences. The attack purposes often are extortion, sometimes espionage, sometimes just, you know, the happiness to disrupt something and to see that things break down. The cyber attacks in the sector grow faster than in many other sectors of critical infrastructure, unfortunately. 
And many hospitals and hospital providers in their despair to restore the services, they pay the ransom fees. But in many cases, even paying ransom fees doesn't ensure you that you would actually get your systems up and running. Fortunately, there are investments now in cybersecurity and they are on the rise, especially for the healthcare sector. Just an example from Germany, they've put aside more than 4 billion euros for the digital transformation of the healthcare sector, especially hospitals. And out of that now 15% has to be actually put into making systems cyber, cyber secure. And that includes processes, solutions, and technologies and architectures. Hopefully that will make these systems, the hospitals more resilient to cyber attacks. Now I would like to talk about the digital transformation because cybersecurity is closely linked to the question of what data is digital and readily available digital and how a company is going completely digital with all their processes so that you know you don't have paper files anymore but systems are digital we look at an example from the automotive industry here and that's volkswagen so the largest automotive oem with toyota in germany who will you know we look at the past and we look at today and the future what this company is doing in terms of digital transformation so the past well you have huge factories producing a large number of cars, streamlined processes, excellent manufacturing. In this case here, around 6,000 maximum capacity of internal combustion engine cars a day. And beautiful cars like this, like a Bugatti Ferron Grand Vitesse, 1,500 horsepower, 430 kilometers an hour, from zero to 400 and back to zero in less than 50 seconds a marvel of engineering with a combustion engine, but maybe not what in today's sensitive world where we talk about climate change, where we talk about sustainability is a car that is a marvel of engineering, but you know, we have alternatives for that. And let's look at where Volkswagen today and in the future wants to be. They will have an all electric product line. And here you see the ID3, very first product, electric car product on their new platform that they are building. But also the other brands of Volkswagen are going electric, like Audi, Skoda, or Porsche. You have full connectivity. VW actually works with large IT service providers like Microsoft and Amazon, and they provide the cloud infrastructure for connectivity so that all the data from the car, which is relevant for new services, could get into the cloud backend. Then they're investing into the energy market and they have new brands like Ellie with charging infrastructure and virtual grids with new offerings regarding the energy because going all electric, now the energy market is very important. Then shared mobility, robo taxis. These are offerings that Volkswagen has. They bought back actually a real car just recently. They have new systems, mobility services like Moya and they're experimenting with robo taxis in a massive way so that you have mobility services beyond the individual car. Then the company goes software centric. So under the brand name of Cariads, from today, maybe 4,000 software engineers, they will ramp up to more than 10,000 software engineers and developers tomorrow, and maybe even beyond that. So Volkswagen invests heavily to transform this company and the software intensive for the software intensive products into a company with a large IT and software workforce. And together with that, there's a lot of training going on. I just mentioned two initiatives here, Faculty 73 and the Audio University, where Volkswagen also trains their own talent in-house. Then they invest hugely into autonomous driving. So for example, startups and collaborations here with Ford and Argo.ai. This is a trend where all the larger OEMs actually work on and they will have gigafactories for batteries, 
like Tesla, who builds big vehicle factories and is not only a car manufacturer, sometimes overlooked, they are also a very large battery manufacturer. So Volkswagen goes into the same segment, will manufacture their own batteries so that the value add of the car, of the electric engine car, the electric uh, vehicle car is also huge. And all that is built on a platform which they call the modular electrification construction kit, a platform that Volkswagen not only uses in-house, but also can license to others. It's collaboration also here with Ford. And then an analogy of that is these platforms and modular structures actually cuts down on the cost, increases the reuse of parts, and is actually one of the key drivers of the success for electric cars in the future. But all this means we have connectivity and we have interfaces and attack surfaces that have to be studied. And this is an infamous attack, which was kind of the wake up call for the industry, the GPAC. Jeep at that time, part of FCA, now the company is called Stellantis. So Jeep and Chrysler is just one of the brands under this new group, a very large group. What actually happened is Miller and Valasek, two cybersecurity researchers proved that a remote wireless attack is possible. What they did is they went through the infotainment telematic control system called Uconnect in Chrysler. They were able to bridge two domains because typically those domains were separated so that you could not go directly from this telematic infotainment domain into critical functions in the car but they were, able, uh, avail, uh, they were able to exp, uh, actually exploit the vulnerability here. And then they could send signals on the CAN bus, which is a central bus system in the car that controls the different embedded control units. And with that, they were able to control braking, pedal and power steering, which was completely unexpected because these systems were typically in their own network, isolated. But through this domain bridging, it was possible to run the attack vector through into the critical systems of the car and to do that wirelessly without any physical uh, kind of connection to the car, which could have worked through an onboard diagnostic unit. That was a hack that then Miller and Valisek also made public and informed the OEM about it. But unfortunately, Chrysler Jeep was not able to fix the problem so fast because it didn't have on over the air update capability. So they had to recall over many months cars into the garage, into the workshops and then fix the problem. And finally, more than 1.4 million cars had to be recalled. Huge costs incurred because not only because of these recalls, but also a penalty, a huge penalty fee was imposed because Chrysler was not able to fix the problem in time. So the US government fined them quite heavily. And that is an example of critical infrastructure or infrastructures, complex systems where hack can actually take over very safety critical functions wirelessly, remotely. And just a brief look at there are several attack surfaces and the car would be not connected at all, you wouldn't have a problem. But if you have connectivity, you can have a problem because these are entry, potentially entry points for attack vectors. And these are just mentioned a few, they have classical wireless connectivity, you have vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to vehicle communication, you have telematic devices like the one we saw that actually was used in the GPAC, but also important, many apps, car IT, nice functions where you can actually gather data from the cloud and from the car or enable certain functions and remotely controlled functions. And then the supply chain itself, and we will talk more about that too. That is a very critical factor here. Just a few points, what are the trends here? When we look at increased connectivity, we do have larger attack surfaces, which we have to be careful with. When we introduce self-driving, like we also saw in the Volkswagen case, we will have severe impact of cyber attacks, higher risks. E-mobility will have higher impact of cyber attacks 
and maybe possible spread of the attack to the smart grid and the smart city because it's very heavily connected. When we have shared mobility, we do have a larger attack surface and maybe the potential to hack an entire fleet. When the supply chain is disrupted and more and more the borderline between OEMs and suppliers is blurred, we have increased possibility of attacks which are difficult to track. And finally, the massive increase of software and complexity as such does mean there will be more and the higher chances of vulnerabilities and maybe inadequate processes to deal with this complexity, which can lead to design flaws. This is a topic which is very interesting because we see now a lot of applications of machine learning and AI and cybersecurity. And I've picked a few, and there are many more of that. But for example, the biometric identification, when you sit in front of a Windows 10 operating system, you have a feature there that the system authenticates you through your face. Uh, so this is a system that uses biometric identification and deep learning for doing that. It is nice because the face is unique and it, if you cannot just you know, fake it so easily, then the system will be very secure in terms of your biometric identification. But many alert and prediction systems use AI and machine learning so that they can track attacks that are coming and predict also behavior and passes of an attack vector. This is in especially important for intrusion detection and prevention system. These are not just a firewall that lets things through and blocks certain traffic based on signatures, but that actually uses complex learning algorithms to understand what is a normal behavior and what is a irregular behavior and what could indicate a potential uh, attack vector. The threat intelligence itself and the risk assessment can be supported by AI. We do see decision support systems in the response for cyber attacks that are supported by AI. The supply chain integrity uses machine learning to understand potential glitches and problems in the supply chain. And finally, security operation centers, they are kind of customer for a lot of these machine learning and AI technologies so that it helps the response teams to deal with cyber threats. I also included some biological analogies because they were already, you know, 20, 30 decades ago, the first uh, research happened on that, for example, on artificial immune systems, cyber hygiene, like what a colleague of mine has worked on, um, virus mutations, parasites, differential diagnostics. Many analogies are there between health and biology and by conditions, irregular conditions in these systems to what you see now in the cyber security space and cyber warfare. And on the other side, we do have the cyber attackers, the criminals, the hackers, and they also use machine learning and AI on the same level of sophistication or maybe higher level of sophistication in some areas. So we do see, for example, deep fakes for spear phishing. The voice is actually completely undistinguishable from maybe your boss who asked you to do something. The pictures are faked, the movements are faked, the behavior is faked, and that uses AI to do that. Obfuscation, so covering up and camouflaging of malware and an attack itself, that is a very important area that uses a lot of sophisticated algorithms so that this malware is very hard to detect. But even the automatic malware, the malware can be generated automatically and hacking tools can be generated automatically or they can be variants of these hacking tools can be generated automatically. The planning and design of an attack vector today can use AI to actually kind of go through all the planning steps. The reconnaissance is supported by that. And of course, the cyber hackers use that for their intelligence on the cyber defense because they want to know what cyber defense is being used mm -hmm. so that they can actually exploit the vulnerabilities and also attack those defense systems itself. Vulnerability scanning and denial, distributed denial of service attacks again use a lot of machine learning and that all will be kind of directed against 
the cyber white hackers who actually want to help and the cyber experts who want to make the systems more secure. And finally, we have a new domain where even AI-based systems are being attacked by working on the intrinsic parts of how these systems work. Hacking tools as at the DEF CON, you know, those tools are readily available here. A lot of, you know, people uh, kind of gathered around those hacking tools and uh, you can buy them freely. DEF CON Capture the Flag Attack and Defense is always a contest where teams work to save their system, secure the system that others attack them. While this has been human against human, the cyber experts against cyber experts, it now also has become machine against machine using AI. And this is a DARPA grand cyber challenge. We actually software AI running on different servers and machines attacks the other machines. And they again, try to defend themselves from cyber attacks. The idea was how far can you drive the automation here in this field so that servers cyber services could be generated automatically or the cyber experts could be kind of relieved from the burden of threat intelligence. And it's amazing what is already possible here in this domain. It's important also that a lot of cyber regulations are coming up now just from the automotive space. An example here, they help to define a framework what the OEMs and TIA should do and in this case, the uh, United Nations ECE Group Working Party 29 came out with a cybersecurity framework that actually led to this R155 and R156 that defines now what cybersecurity measures have to be taken. And we see that, that uh, this means that a cybersecurity management system has to be deployed, which covers a complete life cycle that attacks, threats, and vulnerabilities need to be monitored continuously, that this is not only focusing on the OEM, but also on the complete supply chain and suppliers have to implement their own cybersecurity management systems. The risk management and constant tracking of efficiency and effectiveness is very important. And all car manufacturers in the future through this R5 funds, R5-6 do have to provide software updates over the air and to employ a software update management system because you need to bring in the patches very quickly if a car is being attacked. Risk and threats. This is just you know, a brief overview. Important is you define your assets, the security assets, what you want to protect. You need to an analyze the risk of a cyber attack on these assets. And then you have to quantify the cost of the attack. Cybersecurity is always a kind of balancing act between how much you want to spend on the cybersecurity and how high the risks are to your assets and how vulnerable and how costly your assets are. That has to be balanced out. You perform a threat analysis and risk assessment for short the TARA. And then you define your protection goal, you set the requirements and finally deploy proper measures. These proper measures are more at the end of that. What are your proper solutions to cybersecurity? That could, for example, mean that you encrypt the communication so that an intruder cannot eavesdrop on this communication. And the cybersecurity system like that looks like a cycle where you define your goals, you develop a cybersecurity culture, then you define your organization that implements that across the different functional groups. You do your security risk assessment and define your program. You test your systems, what type of vulnerabilities they have, and then you implement and manage the supply chain. So all that provides systems that will be integrated in the final product. Constant monitoring and detection is very important. And then the cycle goes on and it never stops because this system has to run because the cyber threat landscape is very dynamic. So you always have to monitor and you have to improve your system through key performance uh, indicators and through regular audits so that your cybersecurity management system here is working properly. 
And it's always important to remember that cybersecurity re requires a holistic approach. It is not just you know, enough to kind of defend one part of your system and put all your money there that the defense is strong on this side, but the attacker might go through the easiest entry point and then the system is compromised. So always look at the holistic complete picture. And I want you, as I promised, want to show you what attacks we are looking into here, especially in the domain of battery electric vehicles, because they are fully connected and they need this connectivity to provide their new services. So there can be many attacks here. There could be attacks on remote control features like had happened with a Nissan Leaf to drain out the battery when you remotely switch on devices. The thermal management is very critical of a lithium ion battery. So that could be attacked here. The battery management system itself could be attacked. And we need to also look at the supply chain integrity for the battery management system from semiconductor to the software it employs. Then the charging relies on billing and protocols between the charger and the battery system. This has to be looked into. The charging infrastructure itself in the future will be bidirectional. So the battery will release energy to the grid and will be charged. And that can go on and off many times in a day. So this delicate mechanism has to be secured. Classically, unlock and theft of a car, that's also important. And as I mentioned, yes, bidirection charging will be important for smart grids and smart cities in the future. And that has its own challenges because when the car is being a battery backup in the smart grid system, then you have further security issues to take in, into account. So we are looking at those things and we tell very clearly that this is a very important design goal to make this ecosystem of the electric car cyber secure as well as a look at the car itself and its delicate structures and cyber secure them. The research domains and interests we focus on interdisciplinary research and we see that is a very field of interdisciplinary research if you look at critical infrastructures, then you need to understand the control structures, the systems that are running it the business models that are being um, kind of implemented and you look at the cybersecurity tools you have to make the systems resilient. Ransomware is an interest of us. We study actually different types of ransomware and we monitor what type of ransomware attacks are happening. The threat intelligence uh, is interesting for us because we look at how we apply machine learning and AI for threat intelligence. And we have also many other applications of machine learning and AI in cybersecurity that we are looking at. So this domain, which I just you know, roughly described has many challenges and many interesting research topics. And then we have vulnerabilities and attack scenarios for battery electric vehicles, which I just showed you, and its extension to smart grids when there's bi-directional charging. Cybersecurity of self-driving cars is a huge topic as such, which combines both critical safety critical structures to be analyzed as well as how the different AI components will work in a self-driving car. The food and area tech sector is a very interesting upcoming domain. And uh, here we do have very nice research collaborations uh, to actually take that forward and to understand how this sector can become more resilient. And we do have cybersecurity challenges in smart cities that we need to address. Uh, a smart city without the proper cybersecurity will actually be a no-go. Supply chain attacks, and finally to tell you, there are many other groups at IIITB working in this domain, focusing, for example, in crypto engineering, data privacy, side channel attacks, or network security, policy regulations, and mobile security, as well as vehicle to X communication. So we cover a huge spectrum of cybersecurity domains and challenges. And that actually allows us to sort of interdisciplinary research approach to address very interesting projects and problems. 
some references for today's talk. Of course, I would like to mention this book here that I wrote, it was released in 2019. And now there's also a version in Korean available. So it was just translated. Will I get a copy of that Korean? I cannot read it, but it's fascinating to see that. From a cybersecurity perspective, if you don't know the language, and you look at it, you don't understand what's part of it, but it's uh, a real um, interesting domain to look both at connectivity as well as the cybersecurity in the automotive space. And how to remember your passwords and still be safe. Everybody of us has been told, don't write your passwords on a sticker and don't put it and stick it on your computer or under the table. So maybe that's a solution for that obfuscation, you know, distract the attacker too many, you know, little notes here. So who knows where the real password is written on. With that, I would like to lead over to discussion. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, sir. This was really great talk. We had really great, interesting insights. So can I go ahead with the questions? Yes, please, sure. Yes, sir. The first question is from our Professor Hachan Shankar. Are there strategies possible to isolate IT and OT to prevent the damaging impact caused by cybersecurity breaches? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. There is actually research being done for this type of isolation, but as we do have also conversion, the interaction of those systems, one does have to employ best practices on the IT side and best practices on the OT side and be aware of where the delicate kind of handover from the IT system to the OT system is. And in this uh, example of Stuxnet, that's exactly the problem. There was a Windows operating system zero day exploit that actually could lead to kind of getting into the Siemens controller structure. And this interaction of the Windows operating system as a, a standard IT system and the specific OT systems that actually was the attack vector that the attackers in this case were able to, to exploit. It's not an easy to, uh, topic uh, research is being done and it's a very relevant domain to uh, work on to isolate, uh, isolate those domains as much as possible. Thank you, sir. Uh, the question, next question is also from Professor Shankar. The question says, why not have a non-open standard architectures for controllers to prevent cybersecurity attacks? It makes business sense to invest as the cost of impact of attacks could be very severe. Yes, and there's work going on on industrial control, cybersecurity, and on defining architectures and also resilient architectures. Actually, again, there are best practices out there that are being deployed in uh, various domains. We talk about, for example, in defense in depth approach which goes directly to the different layers of such an architecture and tries to deploy cybersecurity solutions to make it resilient. The, uh, process, the problem is still that we do have, let's say I would say different maturity levels and different domains, how this is being deployed, as well as we have different guidelines and regulations. As I talked about the automotive space, we do have now clear guidelines and regulations what the OEMs and suppliers should do in order to make their system resilient. So the authorities have actually now enforced that. And we will see the same in many other sectors and domains. The exchange of best practices is extremely important from one domain to the other, as well as to be always clear that as much effort we spend on cybersecurity, there will be always attackers that might have a reason to intrude and to exploit the vulnerability. Thank you, sir. The next question is from our dean. Mm -hmm. Sir, 
No, I haven't asked a question. Okay, uh, you have raised your hand, so I thought you'll be having some question. Yeah, okay, I will, since I did raise my hand. Uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Hus, what are the possibilities of um, reasonable jobs in this area as we go ahead? So actually there is a huge demand for cybersecurity specialists in all those areas. And especially if you combine domain specific knowledge because you are protecting systems that you know do have a inherent complexity. So you need to understand some of the technical details in order to protect them. On the other hand, we have this huge cybersecurity knowledge and best practices, what's there. And then we have that management perspective. We talk about organization, we talk about processes, we talk about business cases for cybersecurity because there's huge money involved in both securing the system as well as in the penalties. So the business perspective is also there. And this um, creates jobs across different disciplines. Um, the demand is there and will be there in the future because of this digital transformation drive we will see more and more of cybersecurity jobs coming up. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question will be from our professor Archie de Souza. He's a logistician and uh, th he teaches supply chain management at our college DSU. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, there's a great deal of discussion on blockchain applications. Mm -hmm. How secure are blockchains? Are they hack proof as its proponents claim? That would be a topic, of course, of the crypto algorithms being used. And you know, this is all, you know, when you would talk to a crypto specialist, they would always say maybe, no, there's also no security as such. There's only, you know, the question of how much effort you have to spend to break uh, such a crypto algorithm. Uh, because the crypto algorithms being used in blockchains is symmetric. Uh, kind of cryptography uh, being used um, is well studied, but uh, still not completely from a mathematical point of view, so easy to analyze. And the question always will be how long the keys have to be in order to make this um, kind of secure. Are there any possibilities to kind of fish for the keys? Because even if the encryption algorithm itself as a key lens might be secure, there might be some vulnerabilities where the keys are being kept and stored. And then the whole infrastructure being used for, for blockchain computing and so forth might be also vulnerable. So definitely there's no such thing that complete resilience and complete security, but there are different levels of security that are being implemented with the cost of the computational cost uh, being uh, kind of has to be analyzed for that. Yes. The next question is from the student, Mr. M. L. Enjarappa. How the investment has changed our year, over years on cybersecurity? Fortunately, cybersecurity has become a focus of intention and a lot of investments were done into cybersecurity. The question sometimes is, are the investment done uh, in the correct fields of cybersecurity. Because from my point of view, we often only look at the solutions as certain technology that can be deployed and then feel, okay, that's fine. Now we have a security solution that runs. The problem is you have to invest in the people. You have to invest in the talent, the cybersecurity talent. You have to invest in training and education in the organizational structures, awareness and so forth. And that is often overlooked. Um, and that is, again, this question of a holistic approach. Cybersecurity always is a holistic thing. And often we see that the weakest part of the cyber chain might be the human who is under stress, burdened with something else, distracted, and then opens a mail attachment, although it was always told, don't do that. And still as of today, opening mail attachments with macros enabled, with fileless infection mechanisms as one of the most effective ways to get into systems. And with the spear phishing and deep fakes being used, 
it's very hard actually to figure out if, for example, when a doctor in a hospital would suddenly hear from a colleague who would be deep faked, please quickly click on that. This is an important mail here and see it running to the next appointment uh, or maybe to an operating theater, clicking on that. And then the ransomware is being spread. So that's the issue we have. Uh, holistic and people, that's important in cybersecurity too. Yes, sir. Uh, we have mentioned, I mean, I have brought, dropped down the feedback form in the chat section. Please find it there. And so before winding up, can we take two more questions, if you permit? Sure. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, this question is from Professor Anand Pofli. Uh, Dr. Haas, has the proliferation of cloud technology increased the exposure of potentially multiple targets to a few vulnerable points of failure? Very good questions. I mean, cloud uh, infrastructure and of course dependency on the cloud can use, uh, can actually lead to huge outages. And we do did have that, um, you know, glitches also in running, administering the cloud and then big shutdowns were there and many of the, all of the major cloud providers had the problem. So again, it's two, uh, you know, counteracting processes. One is the cloud is typically administered for the large IT companies with a lot of professional experience. And then keeping your data there and running that with the security environment makes it maybe safer. On the other hand, the targets become bigger and bigger. If you are able to switch out large part of Azure cloud or AWS or other clouds, then you have a major impact. Yeah? So also for the cyber criminals, these targets have become huge, interesting targets. So we have this effect there. Right? It's yet to see, throw in the complexity point, which I mentioned, the complexity of those systems also becomes higher. Are we able to manage all that, this triangle between complexity, interesting targets for cyber attackers, and then you know the security measures and the professional administration of the cloud? That is yet to see. Yes, sir. thank you. Uh, this will be our last question. And sorry uh, for not taking other questions. Please excuse me for that. Uh, this is from Professor Tamil Das. Supply chain risk is a big concern area. OT has become even more riskier during the pandemic. Large supply chain organizations have been thrown by cyber attacks. How ready are supply chain organizations to meet this challenge? Also a very good question. I mean, that is um, um, not a single answer for that. Some are doing a lot. Some are still, you know, keeping up. And we do see the problem that the supply chains, if you look at, for example, the uh, latest incidents there, one example there is solar winds, where actually tools that are part, central part of the administration of IT have been compromised. No? And the easiest way actually to compromise a system is to use and compromise one system that is used by many and then you know you implement a backdoor or you put in a vulnerability and so your supply chain is hacked no? and then you can reach out to a large one that's actually also what happened later on to energy attacks on the ukrainian network they used very simply a taxation module and software that was used all over ukraine and everybody had to use that um, so the backdoor in the system and the Trojan in that system was very effective because all computers could be kind of hijacked in one sweep. So that's really the critical thing. I think that is one of the very fruitful research areas. How do you make sure your critical supply chain is not compromised? How do you make it more resilient? How do you ensure predict uh, probabilities of compromise? And what are the best practices here? to handle that. Thank you so much, sir. You have answered really many questions. It was really understandable by all our participants. Thank you so much. Um, now I would like to ask Ms. Mr. Omkar to 
take the oath of thanks thank you raksha uh, good evening everyone on behalf of uh, the anand sagar university and distinguished speaker series committee it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks uh, my heart feels with a lot of gratitude and respect for our distinguished speaker uh, dr ronald ha roland has uh, for not only sparing his invaluable time for us but also for enlightening us with the commendable uh, tale he has on the subject it gave us a deep deep insight into the topic and also revealed some interesting facts uh, i would also like to thank our dean professor captain nagaraj subbarao sir for giving us opportunity to organize this webinar i would also like to thank all the dsu faculties my heart goes out to the uh, thank our participants for accepting our invitation and attending the session and a special thanks to our mr imtia sir for our technical person who worked in setting up this webinar once again thank you sir uh, for this wonderful wonderful session with this, with this i conclude my vote of thanks thank you so dr haas i think very important as the word becomes more complicated we need to invest in people i think that's a very important message yeah um, which is probably not happening enough yeah absolutely true we should do that no. right right and uh, thank you so much once again It's been an absolute privilege you're welcome so to all stay safe healthy and cyber secure let's keep in touch bye 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 sir thank you sir